So on that, let's um, let, let's let's sort of transition to the the piece in Catalyst, um, which is called "People Should Definitely Check It Out." Still, no shortcuts uh, for climate change. Um, and I want to start uh, by first saying it's sometimes hard to talk about these moments like the Green New Deal because I remember when Bernie Sanders when they first announced like the Bernie Plan um, and being really excited because okay, not only are we going to do something. Um, you know, that's obviously better than Trump or whatever we got through Obama, but there was a real structural dynamic uh, to it. And now it's sometimes hard to sit here in 2021 on the, like the precipice of defeat and trying to see, you know, what Biden and the We Believe in Science crowd are going to do, um, you know, and, and figure out how can we implement the changes that are necessary. So that was a, a, a decent amount of stuff. So maybe just to start how would you sort of categorize the early Biden administration uh, response to climate change, climate catastrophe? I don't know what term we're using uh, these days. <laughs> yeah. Um, apparently, like climate change was like a right wing way to kind of shift the discourse from global warming to make it sound mm -hmm. like less terrifying. But anyway, we all say it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's I feel like there's a lot of hype. <laughs> about Biden's um, climate uh, plan. He has, you know, a, a sort of suggested, um, obviously this infrastructure jobs plan that's trillions of dollars of spending, which if you go back to Obama, you know, far above what Obama uh, presented, you know, Obama's stimulus was like 800 billion. And it was, way, even Paul Krugman was like, this is ridiculous, <laughs> this is way too low. Um, <laughs> And uh, but so, but um, there's two things I would say that a almost all the kind of serious climate people on the left and mm -hmm. even scientists are are saying that two trillion over eight years I think is what he's proposing is just not mm -hmm. it's not enough at all it's not even close to enough. Adam Tooze, uh, the, the sort of economic historian, has a really good piece, I think, in the New Statesman, where he just mm -hmm. lays it out. He said, it's, if, you, if you're serious about decarbonization, it's just, it's just not enough. Um, and so there's been a kind of discourse on the left, like, you know, how much should it be? It should be 10 trillion or 3 trillion. And, and that's fine. Um, but to me, it's also the real uh, kind of more qualitative problem with it is that it's just, um, it's it's not um, really taking control of the issue uh, mm -hmm. through the public sector and through government investment. It's basically a bunch of tax credits and kind of incentives to try to attract private capital to make this energy transition happen. So they want, you know, like a bunch of, for instance, like Danish wind companies to come in and set up offshore wind um, off the coast of the, of the Atlantic uh, Ocean, um, they want um, a bunch of, uh, you know, solar, private solar, you know, anti-union private solar developers to build big solar farms all over. And, and, and to me, like just leaving it to the private sector, just leaving it to capital and hoping that, you know, uh, uh, capital will find a way to make this energy transition profitable is just such a, a losing bet. It's just not well, going to work out. Well, it's one of it's one of those things that I'm curious what what you think about this, um, because it's like we need mass uh, state movement on this because they actually are the only ones who have the capacity to do it. Like even, um, and I think this is one of the problems that kind of like you know American liberalism in the most general sense like falls into like the we believe science crowd. Um, like they failed to recognize the structural co constraints. I can't remember the the guy's name. Boy, he's way older than me. Um, but you know, one of these new Texas like oil executives, um, <laughs> they've you know they they've been he's had like fawning coverage in the Financial Times because he's one of these guys like oh I understand that you know climate change is real and I know that we need to do more and more and more. But like all of these guys are saying this stuff now. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this is the oil industry and like I, one, I don't think these people are doing that stuff with good faith, but I'm just saying like, let's say we convince every oil executive tomorrow that climate change is a problem. Yeah. Structurally, what are the, what do you expect them to do? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you know, like you need to have, you know, the state to get involved. That's why the just transition was such an important um, part of the Green New Deal. Yeah. No, I mean, the whole, the New Deal was, <laughs> you know, like the original one, the OG, you know, it was all about public investment. And, and, and you know, we were in a depression and it was just like, we're just going to take control of this situation and, and just, you know, put people to work and build bridges and, and by the way, build a bunch of energy projects, mm-hmm. hydroelectric dams, uh, you know, they electrified pretty much the whole countryside during the New Deal, like 10% of farmers in 1932 had electricity by 1950, it was 90%. You know, this is the scale of what we need to do now. And it was all led by public investment. Um, pub- and then you start to get into World War II, which is the other sort of familiar analogy where the government just started demanding, you know, you, we need this many planes produced, we need this many tanks. And they were telling, you know, sometimes they were contracting with private capital, but they were saying, you must do this, you, you must mm-hmm. produce this. And that's not what Biden's doing. He's saying, how about a tax credit? Will that make you solve climate change? <laughs> well, like, 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 well, how about this little carrot here? Like, not, like, if you really believe this is a planetary emergency uh, 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 that we're literally like human survival is at stake you need to take control of it we need a massive kind of um public sector mobilization like it is an emergency and and that's not what biden's doing no the what they are acting as if is under stake is like corporate competition like our businesses basically right that's why you hear even warren talk about ip protections um, and why those are going to be vital for fighting uh, climate, cha- or climate change. <laughs> yeah. She uh, also wanted to green the military. That was her. Right. Famous. <laughs> no, and it's like, you know, yeah. And like, I mean, the military has a huge budget, but that's not the really the <laughs> the full answer to climate change there. Yeah. Matt, Matt do you have uh, that that clip, that Obama clip? Oh, yeah. Give me one second. Because I think this is a really good um clip for because uh, you know I, I like talking about you know the the specific climate aspects um here but i think what we, you run up against almost immediately when you're talking about the green new deal or any kind of real action on this is that you have to have a, a stronger like structural understanding of how like american democracy and american capitalism works and you make a really great point in the catalyst piece i don't have it in front of me um, but you know something along the lines about you know obama and oil production um and how you know, it was the fear of capital strike mm-hmm. more than the uh, necessarily just like, oh, he, he's you know bought out. He's got too many people <laughs> giving him campaign donations. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have this clip here, and I think it illustrates it well. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. This is post presidency Obama, right? It's yeah. 2018. If I know what clip it is, <laughs> just like I was as the world is proud. ending. <laughs> I was extraordinarily proud of the Paris Accords because, uh, look, I know. You know, uh, you know, I, I know we're an oil country, and uh, we need American energy. And, and by the way, uh, American energy production, uh, you wouldn't always know it, uh, uh, but, you know, it went up every year I was president. Um, and, the giant you know, that whole suddenly America's, <laughs> like, the, the biggest oil producer and the biggest guy. Uh, that was me, people. I just wanted you to. So... So, uh, <laughs> it's a little like, you know, sometimes you go to Wall Street and folks would be grumbling about anti-business. And I said, have you checked where your stocks were when I came in office and where they are now? What, what are you talking, what are you complaining about? Just say thank you, please. Um, because, because I want to raise your taxes a couple percent. I'm a guy cheering that going crazy in the audience <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what kind of person is doing this? <laughs> people that love obama <laughs> but this is i mean i think this uh example is really important because look this is the belief science guy this is the guy yeah. um yeah. you know exactly. and you know this is somebody you know there's dynamics in obama's presidency that obviously changed with the makeup of congress but this is somebody who had a lot of leeway to do a lot of different things especially early in his presidency and what we got from him was oil production going up every year and then him bragging about it after the fact yeah which is like the most egregious thing 
in, in the face of the climate crisis to, to brag about that. Um, and and so, on some measures, literally he presided over the largest oil and gas boom in US history. <laughs> like it was, it was so dramatic how much um, um, oil and gas production went up. Um, and, and I really wanna kind of give credit to uh, a book uh, called Levers of Power by Kevin Young and, and his co-authors that really actually, they're the one that make this case that, um, and they make it, they, they do a real intense study of the Obama presidency and show on issue after issue, Wall Street, healthcare, climate and environment. Um, he's, um, you know, he was just completely subservient to industry. Now, when studying the climate stuff and the environment stuff, it's a little puzzling because uh, it's pretty much known that the oil and gas industry and um, the energy extractive industry doesn't doesn't really contribute much to the Democratic Party. It's mm -hmm. very much firmly entrenched in the GOP. Um, and so there's not really this story where, yeah, like you said, like it, it's not clear that Obama was bought out by campaign contributions or anything like this. So in Levers of Power, they argue that it was really more the they call it the structural power of business to engage in a capital strike. Mm. That really, particularly in the face of the financial crisis of 2008, that 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 would would just further destabilize the economy. Do you mind? It's, do you mind just sort of like briefly for folks who aren't familiar with that term, what capital strike means? Yeah. So we know what a labor strike is. Most of us, when the when labor withdraws, it uh, and workers don't show up, and they create a crisis. But capital can strike too because they control investment. And because they are, you know, basically they are the the lifeblood of of jobs and, and economic activity and GDP growth and all this stuff. And if they if they withdraw investment, they can they can actually exacerbate or, or they can create a crisis, but they can exacerbate a crisis. And so in two thousand nine, Obama's number one priority is just trying to kind of bring us back from the abyss of this <laughs> cataclysmic crisis. And so um, he was talking a lot about, actually, he was talking about something called a Green New Deal in 2009. He was talking about, you know, in his campaign acceptance speech, he said, like, this is the moment where the oceans begin to recede and, and, and the planet begins to heal. He was talking about big regulations on Wall Street. But, but what the book argues is that the threat of a capital strike and the threat of kind of withdrawing investment and, and throwing the economy back into crisis basically forced him to just do whatever um, industry wanted. And so, and it's it's just astonishing when you start to look at it, like um, in uh, March of uh, 2010, he announced a major uh, initiative to open up much of the Atlantic seaboard to offshore drilling. <laughs> and he was just gonna do this. Mm -hmm. And he actually gave a speech where he said that you know, the great thing about offshore drilling now is they don't, uh, the technology is so sophisticated, they don't spill anymore, and it's really great. And then literally three weeks later, the Deepwater Horizon blowout happened. We had the worst maritime oil spill in U.S. history. And um, he, and then, <laughs> and then even in that, like, he basically handed over the cleanup to uh, uh, BP and British and was like, you guys figure this out. And they didn't have any capacity to figure it out. And he's just like, well... So anyway, um, and, and so throughout the Obama years, you see this just total subservience to the fossil capital. And, and it's a little puzzling unless you kind of look, um, look at this more kind of structural power that the energy industry has over society as a whole. Yeah, those engine, it's always, I, you know, I remember with the Dakota Access Pipeline thing, all of the sort of engineering statements you get about how safe these things are. And it's just like an entire culture to itself. And immediately after the thing's in, it's starting to leak. Um, and that's, it's like, uh, if you, you can fucking love science, but you also better like <laughs> fucking trust industry. Um, basically. Yeah, trust industry. <laughs> but, uh, BP was like throwing trash and golf balls down there to try to plug the... <laughs> it's so insane uh, yeah, to, to, to realize... And the people who have like direct power in those situations, how they're how they're trying to deal with the problems.